Hello and welcome to MMA Nut Real Talk. I'm your host, Sebastian Vendel Martinez, and as most of you watching this probably know by now, this is just where I give my unscripted, unedited thoughts on all things MMA and combat sports. Now, we did not do an episode yesterday, which means there's a little bit of catching up to do, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, I just quickly want to touch on uh, UFC Vancouver, uh, because there were a lot of fights uh, announced for that card uh, yesterday, which we didn't really get a chance to talk about. Uh, so there's, I guess there's one big fight and one big fighter. Um, so let's start with a big fight, the light heavyweight bout between uh, Glover Teixeira and Nikita Krylov. Uh, Teixeira from Brazil and Krylov from Ukraine. Uh, and this is kind of like a crossroads fight for both of them, that's the way I see it. Uh, Teixeira, he had a bit of a... a like the loss to, to Corey Anderson was, was pretty bad. Uh, he was very heavily favored to win and he did not look good in that fight. He got completely outgrappled. He has though since come back with two pretty impressive wins uh, against uh, solid competition, Carl Robertson and uh, Ion Kutalaba. Both fights where he experienced adversity and managed to come back from it. Uh, so he's taking on Nikita Krylov who returned to the UFC. Um, last year in, for uh, UFC Moscow, he lost that fight to Jan Blachowicz. To be fair, Blachowicz is one of the most underrated guys in the division. Uh, perhaps people look past him because he's got a name that's kind of hard to pronounce, but uh, Blachowicz is a, a solid, solid uh, uh, top contender in uh, light heavyweight. And this is a bit of a crossroads because the way I see it, if Teixeira loses, it's kind of like he's then he gets relegated to gatekeeper position. Now, to be fair, I don't think any of us truly expect him to challenge for a title sometime soon. Uh, I kind of, the way I see it, that ship has kind of sailed. But the question is, is he going to get big fights, meaningful fights and, you know, co-main events or, you know, if stuff goes well enough, even main events, perhaps for fight night cards in Brazil or something like that? Or is he going to, you know, headline the undercard? Is he going to be the first fight out on the main card? Uh, I do not think so in this case, uh, because I think that uh, Teixeira beats Krylov. Uh, Krylov, he's one of those guys who, he was such a fantastic talent, and uh, you know, I think we were all like, kind of expecting a lot from him, but he loses all those must fights. He lost against Misha Sirkunov, and he lost against Jan Blachowicz, and those are like the must fights, but he, you know, he has to beat those fighters in order to break through. Uh, and, the, I don't know, I feel like Teixeira is kind of getting better uh, with age in some strange way. Uh, his past two fights I felt really were telling in the way that he can sort of adapt and overcome. Uh, I, I just thought, you know, he did really well in those fights and I see him as having, uh, I mean, Krylov will probably be the faster fighter. Uh, a bit more dynamic, a bit more explosive, a bit more unorthodox. But I just think that Teixeira's grit and experience will, uh, will take him to victory. Now for the big fighter, we've got Todd Duffy returning. Uh, finally, he's one of the least active fighters in the heavyweight division, which is a big shame because he actually holds the record for the, UFC, uh, for the fastest knockout in UFC heavyweight history at just seven seconds. Uh, he has been, he's like the heavyweight version of Dominic Cruz in that he's always getting injured uh, or there's always, you know, just problems preventing him from fighting. Uh, he hasn't fought since, let's see here, uh, 2015. So it's been about four years since he last stepped into a cage. He's facing Jeff Hughes, uh, who lost his UFC debut to Morris Green by a split decision, but looked pretty good in Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series before that. Uh, I think that, unfortunately, the ship has sailed for Duffy. Uh, I have a hard time seeing him getting back, and you know, like the knockout loss that he had to Frank Mir, uh, it was, for, for as, let me put it this way, for as powerful as Duffy is himself, I don't feel like he's very good defensively. I feel like, you know, he leaves a lot of openings and kind of gets a little bit overzealous and he's, I just don't feel like he's super great at, at uh, taking the shots either. Uh, so I think that he, you know he will. I think he's probably gonna win this fight. But even if he does, I have a very hard time seeing him just you know get to the point that we all thought he would.
previously in his career. Uh, he was hailed as you know the next big thing at heavyweight, uh, especially after that impressive uh, knockout in his UFC de debut. But it's just been unfortunately he's, it's too inconsistent, uh, both in terms of performances and also in terms of uh, of how active he's been. Aside from that, we got uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. versus Uriah Hall. Uh, great fight in middleweight. Uh, Andrew Sanchez versus David Branch, another good middleweight bout. Kind of feel like Branch <sighs> sort of on his way out. Andrew Sanchez has also had a bit of a tough time recently, but uh, Branch has had two pretty tough uh, losses where he's been finished. Uh, uh, first by Jared Cannonier and uh, then by Jaquel Manson. Uh, last out, we've got another heavyweight bout between Martin Tibura and Augusto Sakai. Probably Tibura wins that one. Oh, now to the most uh, depressing news. <laughs> uh, BJ Penn uh, caught in, in a street fight with a bouncer outside of a nightclub slash strip club. And honestly, I feel like it's time for BJ Penn's team to step in because I, I always it, it's pretty clear to me that he's not doing well I mean obviously he's he's on a seven fight losing streak and hasn't won a fight since 2010 but even aside from that I mean his wife filed a restraining order against him his response to that was just flat-out bizarre uh, he basically said that he couldn't have sexually harassed any women because they're so soft and like, I don't know, he had a really weird way of, of defending himself there. And now something like this, I mean, admittedly, I don't know who the people in the video are, uh, the ones who are like are on, on his side, so to say. But regardless, of, of like, I mean, his team needs to say something to him uh, because he's not, he's not delivering in the octagon and he seems to be going through a lot of stuff personally. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to maybe be horsing around with a friend that you know, but, you know, I even read online that uh, uh, that this was not a, uh, a bouncer, but a, a waiter, which is, which is even worse. Now, admittedly, Penn is not, like, striking. Uh, it, it's, it's all grappling, and what is the most disgusting thing of the video is actually some guy who walks over and starts punching Penn in the head. Luckily, that doesn't go on for very long, but... You know, according to the nightclub owner, BJ Penn, he was behaving in a very drunk manner, and it's just, it kind of feels like he's reached, like, a, a dark period in his career. And I just, for me personally, you know, who am I as a journalist to say to a former UFC champion, you should retire? I mean, right? But still, I think most of us watching this, watching this video kind of feel the same way, but this type of behavior is usually some kind of reflection of what you're going through inside and usually when you, you you're behaving in this way you're not going to perform very well in the octagon anyway uh, when you have a lot of stuff going on in your life that's stressing you out it's it tends to get in the way of your performances now like i said bj penn's team isn't necessarily super involved in any of his personal life as such but i do feel like we have a responsibility to kind of tell him to, to steer him in a different direction, uh, maybe like to focus on coaching, something like that, uh, because I, d I don't want to see, st you know, I, I like BJ Penn, it's hard not to like BJ Penn, he's, he's, uh, he's a true OG of a lighter weight division, he's most likely the best lightweight ever, although Khabib Nurmagomedov was giving him a run for his money there, uh, and it's really hard, tough to see, you know, a, a legend of his status, uh, just fall into a, a record-breaking losing streak and then all these controversies outside I don't want to see any more of it I hope you know Penn's team and those around him can steer him in the right direction and just get rid of get rid of this stuff and, and put him put him back on track uh, on to the next story uh, Dana White wants John Jones's uh, disqualification loss to Matt Hamill from 2009 overturned uh, and at the very least turned into a no contest. Now, uh, for me personally, I think, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can say whatever you want about John Jones personally uh, and, you know, his previous drug busts and, you know, he has tested positive for banned substances. He was involved in a hit and run. He's been involved in DUI uh, incidents. So, I mean, 
those things obviously point to a pretty shady character, but I'm not talking about his character. When it comes to him as an athlete, and especially, you know, this was early on in his career also where I personally don't really think that he was mixed up in some, you know, uh, illicit substances. Uh, all that aside, this was a ridiculous disqualification loss. Uh, but 12 to 6 elbow rule is... It's been under critique and ridicule for a long time, and the fact that referee Steve Mazzagati decided to try to talk to Matt Hamill, who was deaf and who had, uh, you know, blood in his eyes and his eyes closed, obviously is not going to respond. Uh, it, it was just a bad call uh, all around, and uh, honestly, that should at the very least be a no contest. Uh, honestly, like Hamill has. He had, I recall there being uh, some discussion afterwards of him actually, it was a shoulder injury that forced him to uh, want to not continue the fight as opposed to the elbows. And if that's the case, then it definitely should not be a disqualification. Uh, it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, I personally really don't like the stuff that Jones is involved with uh, personally and the stuff that he's been implicated with, the performance enhancing stuff, the repeated drug offenses and the behavior outside of the cage. And, and, like the way he treated a colleague of mine, Isabel Flunko, at uh, at the UFC 232 at a press conference, uh, it was uh, it was bully behavior. But at the end of the day, when he's in the cage, uh, I, I try to leave the personality out of it and focus on him as an athlete. And him him as an athlete is, does not deserve that loss. Simple as that. Um, we've got. Colby Covington going hard after Ben Askren. Uh, so let's just jump right into the quote here. Uh, this was a, in a, an interview with MMA Junkie. Uh, Colby Covington said the following, Ben Askren doesn't even have a UFC win yet. He needs to get a UFC win before he starts talking. And even when he gets, a, gets one UFC win, you're going to need a couple to get a title shot. You don't get gifted title shots because you talk about your shit on Twitter or on Instagram. Hmm, it's a little ironic coming from Colby Covington considering how much attention he's got for his controversial statements, but okay, let's continue the quote. Your resume speaks for itself. His resume is dog shit. He beat nobody. He's got a bunch of nobodies on his list. He was beating a bunch of cans in Asian bingo halls. That's all his resume consists of. Um, can we call that Colby Light? Because that's really not as bad as I was expecting when I first started seeing the headlines pop up. Um, he, ha he has some point. I mean, on on the one hand, uh, on a, like a sportsmanship side, uh, it's very clear that Ben Askren is fishing for a fight, a title fight with Kamaru Usman. He started a feud... Like, he started beefing with uh, Usman pretty much as soon as he got to the UFC. Uh, even before he was even in the UFC, he was already beefing with, like, Darren Till and stuff like that. But that's kind of his style. He is the... He's a very, very mild version of Colby Covington in some ways, which is why I think it's kind of ironic that Covington is giving, you know, giving him grief for, quote-unquote, talking shit on Twitter or Instagram. Now, admittedly, Colby Covington does a lot more of that inside of a cage. But uh, here, I mean, I think Covington, he's, uh, he's a hypocrite. Uh, he's got no right to, to go after someone like Ben Askren, who is very vanilla. I mean, he's, you know, this is somebody's hair and this is boom roasted. It's very, very non-personal stuff. It's, it's very like, it's kind of like when your dad is trying to make fun of you. It's, it's, it's pretty harmless. Uh, whereas Covington, he crosses the line a lot uh, with a lot of things. I mean, he even he crossed the line for Dana White, uh, and I mean, I think that some of Colby's behavior has played a part in uh, in him not getting a title shot and the UFC stripping his interim title. And I don't see why he's all. Why well, he's so angry about this, uh, or I, I guess I can't see why, because he does not want Askren to go ahead of him in, in the queue for a title shot. But, I mean, I don't think anyone's discounting the fact that if Covington beats Robbie Lawler, that he's going to get the next title shot. I think most people kind of see that coming. 
So, Colby, chill out. I mean, honestly, this this is his shtick. Uh, obviously, he, he doesn't act the way he does when cameras are off. Uh, but, you know, this is the pers personality that he has decided to, to stick with and that he's decided to use. In that case, that's the one that he's going to get judged for when it comes to these kinds of statements. And here, no, uh, Colby Covington's being a hypocrite. Uh, uh, ben Askren's resume, it does speak for itself. And you can discount all the fighters you want in one championship, but I, I feel like uh, Ben Askren's skills have improved time and time again, uh, both in one championship and in Bellator. And while his win over Robbie Lawler in his UFC debut was very controversial, he still got to that point through sheer talent. I mean, he did get a bulldog. It's not like he just was gifted a bulldog choke on Robbie Lawler uh, the moment he stepped into the cage. Like, that's the way they were started up. No, he got into that position from surviving a barrage of heavy strikes, making it through that, and then getting a, an advantageous position with the grappling. Uh, I think, yeah, we can't discount Ben Askren's skills. And running off a little bit here, finally, the first fight has been announced for uh, uh, UFC Copenhagen, which will be on September 27th. I will be there. It's actually, despite me being based in Sweden, Copenhagen is actually way closer to where I live in, in Stockholm. Uh, so I'm definitely looking forward to this. Uh, welterweight bout between Gunnar Nelson from Iceland and Thiago Alves, Brazilian staple of division. Uh, and this is definitely a bit of a contrast of styles. We've got Gunnar Nelson, who's a very, very skilled grappler, uh, black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and uh, he's got a kind of weird karate-type style standing. Uh, and then Thiago Gallo is just a, a classic Muay Thai practitioner, uh, classic Muay Thai, Thai boxing style, uh, eight-point attack. Uh, but this is a fight that I see Gunnar Nelson winning. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I mean, first of all, he does have a very clear advantage on the ground. Uh, but we all know that Thiago Alves does not want to go into this fight uh, to go into a grappling match with Gunnar Nelson. Obviously, he wants to keep his standing, so we know that. How does he, do, how does he go about that? Well, he needs to establish a distance, he needs to establish power, but I just feel that his last couple of fights have been a little bit telling and that it feels like he's lost a bit of a killer instinct. I feel like the, the fight with Alexei Kunchenko in particular, it's like he could never really pull the trigger. And even like like his fight against Max Griffin, which he won uh, by split decision, uh, I would have to rewatch that fight to immediately say like who if that was right or wrong uh, off the top of my head i recall it being one of those fights that was pretty close and i was kind of leaning towards max griffin but when they called out Thiago alvis i was like okay fair enough uh, but even there it's like it was it was a fun entertaining fight but you know i didn't see that pit bull you know he's tiago the pit bull out of this and i didn't see the pit bull there and he's coming off of a loss to uh Oh, this guy has a hard name to pronounce. Laureano Staropoli uh, from Argentina. Uh, who And that was just his second UFC fight. And I feel like... I mean, I might get proven completely wrong and he'll come into this fight in, in Denmark with 100% killer instinct. But I just feel like we haven't seen that. And I mean, fighters like, like Jim Miller who, you know admittedly have different styles but have a very similar strength as Gunnar Nelson and that you know it is the grappling uh, I just I just see uh, Gunnar Nelson as having too many weapons in his arsenal uh, now he did come up short in his last outing against uh, Leon Edwards it was a split decision loss uh, which was fair I think uh, Edwards did enough to win that fight but Leon Edwards was very very smart with that fight uh, he had a measured attack he, he established distance well, and when we you know when there were ground exchanges, he he kept himself he kept himself out of out of danger. Uh, and Thiago Alves, he's not, traditionally speaking, he's not a fighter who keeps himself out of danger. 
Uh, I mean, I think we all remember the Martin Campman fight where he was winning the fight. I mean, in the very last round, shoots for a very ill-advised takedown and gets submitted. Um, even, even, even some fights like when he fought Papi Abdedi, he was losing the beginning of that fight. Uh, and it's, you know, kind of because he does put himself in these risky situations. Uh, I do think, though, this is going to be a very fun fight, and I think uh, everyone, including Thiago Alves himself, would benefit from going guns blazing, because I do feel like he kind of has to try to try to finish early here, kind of like what Santiago Ponzinibbio did when he knocked out Gunnar Nelson, but minus the eye poke. Uh, I feel like Thiago Alves, he has to go in, he has to be aggressive, he has to establish distance, and he has to establish power very early. So that it's not Gunnar Nelson deciding uh, the, the distance and range, but I just I have a hard time seeing that happening. So um, yeah, I don't know. I, gonna, I think we're gonna see a Nordic victory here for Iceland. And yeah, that about does it. Uh, there was quite a few new stories to go through, but those are my thoughts on those fights. And. Uh, you guys should obviously let us know your thoughts in the comments below. It's a lot of fun to read your comments. You, well, the ones that are, that are kind of mean are, are not as fun to read. But uh, regardless, it's interesting to see your guys' point of view. Even if you do disagree with the things I'm saying, it's, it's interesting to see like how um, the normal fans think about these different issues. And uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff to, to go for here. I can see a lot of people that are going to throw a lot of hate at Dana White for supporting John Jones in this decision. And, you know, I do as well. But... It is what it is, as they say in this biz. So, I was your host, Sebastian Venom Martinez. This was MMA News Real Talk, and uh, yeah, we will catch you guys in the next video.